Hello everyone. Again, my name is C.B. Averett and I'm a senior consultant with DQ Systems. I'm broadcasting to you today from Austin, Texas. I'm attending an Access U Accessibility Conference this week. I'm doing three presentations this week. If any of you are able to be here, please stop by and say hello to me. I'm telling you this because one of my slides actually has uh, some information that I'm doing a presentation on this week. So you guys are gonna get a sneak preview of something I'm talking about this week. But welcome again to the Mobile Web Accessibility. Uh, we are going to, oops, I'm sorry, hold on just a moment here. So uh, the summary for this uh, presentation is it's, it's a mobile web accessibility where we're, our, where we're going to learn web accessibility development techniques for mobile devices and testing with mobile screen readers. Hopefully you're going to be able to demonstrate how to use automated mobile web accessibility testing tools in addition to manual testing with assistive technology. Our agenda for the day are just going to be these items, I hope, time permitting, uh, and then in, in, in this order as well. So Safari and developer tools, readability and resizable text, color contrast, and accessible design, heading structure, mobile forms, labels versus placeholders, required fields, HTML5, mobile accessibility, way ARIA for mobile screen readers, some data table accessibility support, and we're going to do accessibility testing with mobile screen readers and then mobile web accessibility testing tools. And I'm also going to talk to you about some languages and localization. So one of the things that I, I use, and, and this is one of the tools that I use when I do um, my testing uh, for mobile devices uh, is Safari and the developer tools. And uh, you can find in, in, in Safari, uh, uh, if you're using a Mac, under the advanced area, uh, a, a, a checkbox that says show develop, uh, develop menu uh, in the menu bar. And, and then also on the actual Safari, uh, on your mobile device, you need to go to Safari and then advance and then do web inspector and make sure that that is turned on. It is not turned on by default. Actually, I don't think either one of these are, are turned on by default. Now, why am I telling you this now? Uh, the reason why I'm telling you this now is because through this presentation, I'm gonna be using this, utilizing this tool quite a bit. Uh, it, why do I use this? If you guys have ever used like, um, the inspector tool or firebug, uh, like firebug for, for Safari, I mean, excuse me, for uh, Firefox, uh, where you can pull up some code and you can examine the code and you can make changes on the fly and test things. Well, that's what this tool does for me for a mobile device. So I could pull up the HTML code and I could change the code on the fly, but what I'm actually doing is I'm changing the code that's on my device. Uh, all this should make sense probably here in just a few moments. Now, one of the things that we do need to realize between mobile web and desktop web is that there's a lot of sim similarities. Uh, for example, if you have a heading structure correct on a, on a desktop, uh, there's a really good chance that that would be uh, done the same on a, on a mobile device. And, and there's a lot, a lot of crossover. There's some things that aren't a crossover though, and this is po probably one of those. Um, this is for resizing text. Uh, there is a, a meta, there's a meta tag that is called viewport. And a lot of times designers and developers, they don't want you to be able to pinch to zoom. So they cut this feature off. And the way they cut this feature off is they take the, the uh, maximum scale equals one or, or and or, they use content user scalable equals no. What that does is it prevents the users from zooming in, being able to pinch to zoom. So if, if someone wants to make something larger, if a person with a disability would like to make something larger, then they can't do it. Now, the nice thing about this is in iOS in version 10, this, they've, they've turned this off. So even if you have this, even if you have this as your code, 
it's, it's not going to work if, if you have version 10 because they realize the importance of being able to pinch the zoom. On an Android device, there's a mechanism where you can go in and actually turn that off as well. So, so pinch to zoom would work on both, both devices. However, sometimes if you've got like a, like a Facebook or, or Twitter or, or pretty much anything in mobile devices now, they have uh, like their own, their own browser, which is just really a version of Safari on iOS. But sometimes those, those browsers uh, that are linked to an app, sometimes those are still older models, oh, excuse me, older versions and the pinch to zoom is still in place. So the best thing to do is to make sure that that's not the case here. Uh, if you set the maximum scale equals to two, that would be 200%, and that's what the uh, success criterion uh, reads, uh, the WCAG, and make sure that content user scalable uh, equals no is not there as well. Uh, we deal a lot with color contrast. Um, now what color contrast is used for, and the purpose of this is if you have uh, people that might have color blindness uh, and they're unable to see the, from the background or the foreground, um, this is a very uh, this is very important to make sure that the color contrast meets meets the um, success criterion uh, ratio. And there's several places that just that just don't do that. And I've got a couple examples here, even Google. Like uh, the next in Google, or actually all those numbers in Google, there's a uh, um, they have uh, the Google logo with several uh, several O's, and then it's one through ten. The the the, the items that are in blue that actually fails uh, color contrast, and then also even on the Apple Store, if you go there, you can see that there's like there's uh, some sections in there where there's like a gray text that's on a gray background. And that just doesn't meet the color contrast that's, that's needed. And the color contrast, depending on the size of the text, is typically 4.5 to, uh, to 1. So um, this doesn't meet that. Um, there's also color contrast issue on placeholders, on links, when you hover, when you focus. Uh, and this, this, the last bullet here that I have is keyboard focus online. Excuse me, outline, keyboard focus outline. Now, this doesn't necessarily fall under the contrast, but this is a this is would be what what we would consider an impact a level as critical if it's not there. And what that is 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 it's is, is if you're if you're a keyboard only user, and this this kind of aligns more to the desktop user, but if you're a keyboard only user and you're tabbing you got to get an outline of the active element that's that's received focus. If you don't have that, the keyboard only user is unable to know where they are on the page. Uh, it, it is a, it is definitely a critical uh, error uh, and should be fixed immediately. Um, but uh, there's a lot of designers out there that make that in their CSS as outline zero and cuts that off, and that 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 would be a huge failure. I also have something on the right over here. That is a. Um, this is the, the color contrast analyzer. This is made more so for desktop, but I'm going to kind of show you how we can utilize that uh, for for mobile devices as well. Um, by by the way, the color contrast issues that I found for Google and from Apple that that's used with a tool called HTML Code Sniffer, and I'm going to show you how that works here in just a few, few moments. But let me, I'm going, to, I'm going to be going back and forth, back and forth between my mobile device, between, uh, it, between some browsers, between some screen readers. Uh, again, there's, there's, there's a lot of things that you can do on a desktop to, to see if, if something is broken or, and, and to kind of figure out how to remediate. But, but the, the bottom line is at some point, you really got to be doing the testing, if at all possible, on a mobile device, actually pulling it out. And that could be an Android device, and that, or that could be an iOS Apple device. Uh, I do want to show you this color contrast analyzer and kind of how it works. So let me get over there. Bear with me just a moment here. And what I'm doing now is I'm going to open up... Um, Actually, I'm going to do something a little, well, I'll do this. So I've, I've, I've opened up Google here, and there's a contrast analyzer. And, and 
what I have on the on the page right now is I've opened up Internet Explorer and I've got the color contrast analyzer uh, open and we have these um, these these color pickers that that we can go in and actually find the color I want and then click on it and then I do the foreground and I'm going to do the background as well. And we can see right here that the color contrast analyzer that I just did for Google. Google right now I have on the screen uh, Internet Explorer open and, the, and the, the logo Google is up. And there's several different colors of Google. And the one I chose was this yellow color that's uh, kind of in the middle. And that, that fails. Uh, it's, a, it's a contrast ratio of 1.7 to 1. So that would be a failure. Uh, but this is how you use that color picker. Now, if, if I, I, I could do this same thing by pulling up uh, my, my uh, device uh, using any kind of uh, uh, tool that, that broadcasts your, uh, your device to your screen, or at the very least, take a screenshot. Take a screenshot of what you have uh, from your device and email it to your desktop or something. I mean, there's all kinds of different avenues that you can do. Uh, however, you really, really, if at all possible, want to let the automated tools check for color contrast. Well, the reason being is because the automated tools actually does that. They do that very well. Um, the color picker is an alternative. However, the problem with the color picker is if you're off, like if you're just one pixel off in, in a bad direction, you might not pick the right hex code that that text is actually coded so you can get off a little bit so if at all possible uh, for mobile devices i would use the uh, html um, code sniffer and um and use that instead of a um, the these drops these color pickers okay So let's talk about heading structure here. Um, some of you may know that it's, it's, it's imperative that we have a correct heading structure. And what I mean by that is the HTML code is going to be H1 through H6. H1 means it's like the top level, and then H6 is going to be the, the last, and then any number in between. And there's a hierarchy. So in other words, H2s would typically go under H1s. H3s are going to typically go under h Twos. So a really good way to look at this too is if you have like a file structure, like a folder structure for your for your files uh, on your on your Mac or on your PC. Typically, you put that in a structure. You you have a top level, and then you, you know you might add something like expense reports. That's your top level, and then the one underneath that could be the 2017, and then underneath that could be May. Uh, and, and you can just keep drilling down. And if you can kind of think of it like that, that's the way the heading structure is going to work. And screen reader users utilize that heading structure to be able to navigate around the page. And there's no difference with that uh, and mobile devices. And so let me pull up a couple of things here. Okay, what I'm pulling up right now on a desktop is this is a site that we have that we just kind of use for testing purposes. It has knowing, it no, it, we knowingly have issues on the site. Uh, so it's not, it's not fully accessible. But actually one of the things that's really good about it is that the heading structure is not, is not too bad. And again, I'm on a desktop right now and I do have my Firefox browser. And I'm just gonna go up and I'm gonna outline all my headings here. And you'll, you can see that there's a Wings Airline uh, H1. There's a Fly Wings Airline H1. There's an H3 that's under Fly Wings Airline. I would actually count that H3 as a failure because what, so what the developer is doing is they're using a, um, a, a heading for styling. That what they wanted is they wanted it to be bold. So they used an H3 when really that's just a paragraph. But if we move on down, there are some headings that are H2 headings, uh, which are earned bonus miles, mileage sign-in, special offers. All of those are H2s, and they're, they're, fair, they're done fairly well, I think. I want to try pulling this, let me see if I can pull the same one up on a mobile device. Let 
and bear with me here just a moment. I've got my mobile device open, and what you see on the screen is my mobile device live. So what you're seeing here is the um, the same thing that I'm doing. So I just pre pressed on the wings, and I'm going to go in here, and I'm going to turn on my voiceover for this, and I'm going to just navigate through headings. I'm going to show you all how to do this in just a few moments, but uh, let me go ahead and do that now. Voice over on Safari Wings Airlines heading level one. Visit link. Okay, so I've got I've got my voiceover on, and my 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 rotor right now is set for headings. So when I swipe from the top down, I'm going to go to the next heading. So let's listen to that. Where do you want to go today? Heading level two. That seems appropriate. I'm going to swipe down again. Fly Wings Airlines, heading level one, visit, link. Okay. There could be an argument made that that might be, need to be heading level two. I'm going to swipe down again. Book your trip today. We are happy to have you come on board, heading level three. So it's giving me heading level three. It's probably not accurate. I'm going to keep swiping down. Lorem if some dollars to earn bonus miles, heading level two. So it's heading level two. So, so my screen reader user is able to tell me exactly what those headings are. Uh, and I'm going to, uh, again, I'm going to teach you guys how to, or show you guys how to do that here in just a few moments. Let me turn this off. Voice over off. Uh, I tell you what, while I'm here too, I do want to show you what I was talking about uh, uh, early on with the developer tool. Right now I can go into my Mac uh, and let me put this up here to the side. So on my screen right now, I have Safari open. And I have, I'm broadcasting live from my, uh, from my iOS device, from my Apple device. So one side of my screen is Safari, and then the other side is my Mac, excuse me, it's my uh, uh, iOS device. And uh, the, way, the way we do this is we go to developer, and then I go over here to that. So, just if you're familiar with like Firebug or Inspector Tools, this is really, really similar. I can go in here and change. I'm going to just do something really, really crazy here. I'm going to change my background color to uh, something crazy like black. But change my black, my background color to black, and you'll notice you'll notice uh, that what's broadcasting live on my iPhone on the right is it, it just changed it in real time. Now this is really really helpful too because I can go in here and I can make a change if I want to figure out how to remediate something. I can go in here and make a change and then test it and then and, and it's it's all real time. It's all on the fly so to speak. And I'm able to send that information to possibly a developer uh, and they can take that and and they can make those changes and 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 everything's everything works out really well. All right, so I'm going to move on here to mobile forms. So, uh, so let's talk about mobile forms, okay? So, so there's several things we need to know about this, and again, this is one of those things that kind of cross over from uh, from from desktop over to um, uh, over to mobile. Uh, but there are certain things that has to happen. First of all, you, you have to have a visual label. There is a visual label is required for a form, um, and sometimes, uh, well, uh, there's there are some exceptions. For example, uh, a search input. If if you got a search input that's at the top, that's in the, you know in the top of the header, and you've got a a big button beside it that's a magnifying glass. You don't necessarily need the word search there. The magnifying glass kind of acts as that. Uh, SS number, social security numbers, telephone numbers. I don't. You know, there's like if there's like three form elements. Uh, for example, on a telephone, you'd have like uh, area code, prefix, suffix. I don't need to have those words visually on the screen. However, I do need to have the word telephone on the screen. And the same thing goes with social security number. You don't need to separate those out. There's ways to do that um, using the title attribute that you give the programmatic association, um, but you don't need to have a visual label for each one of those. However, 
Labels must have programmatically associated labels. Typically, we do what's called the 4ID method. Uh, one of the really nice things about mobile uh, that we that we're, we deal with is um, if you have the 4ID method in place, you can tap on the label. Uh, you tap on the label and actually select the form element, and that's that. That would uh, hold true for for radio buttons and check boxes. So if you got a little tiny check box on the screen, you you by making sure that you do the four ID method or or pro programmatically associate the the label uh, with the form element. If you do that, then you've got a, a, a bigger space that you can click on. So what I want what I want to look at now is I want to show you what it looks like before. Uh, before accessibility is in play. And I'm going to go back over here to my PC and I'm going to show this on two different things. I'm going to show you on Android, uh, not Android, I'm sorry, show you on Firefox with uh, NVDA. So let me go to this page. Now, what, what's incredibly important is that when a screen reader user lands on a form element, the name, role, and value is announced to the screen reader. Because keep in mind, the screen reader cannot, the, the uh, user of screen readers cannot see what's here on the screen. So it's got to get the announced to them. So if I look at my first form element underneath contact us, it's first name. Now, first name um, is acting kind of like a placeholder at the moment. So that's actually another issue. But um, when, when I turn NVDA on, let, let me uh, do that and let, let me let you listen to what this is going to sound like. Contact us. Okay, so um, I've just turned on NVDA and I'm just going to do some Contact background us. here. HTTP list. Collapse. First name star edit has auto complete. List. First name star edit has auto complete. So what it said was Blank. first name star has auto complete. Um, so what that did. So 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 I'm gonna turn NVDA back off, and I want to let you know what what it actually announced. Phone number. App. NVDA. App. Okay. Okay. Button. Mo so let's go look at this code here. I'm gonna go inspect the element. And you will, you will notice here uh, that there's an input, but there's no label. So what you actually heard was the placeholder. So what do you think would happen when that input receives focus and the placeholder goes away? So the accessible name, in this case, first name, goes, goes away. We won't be able to have that anymore. So th that's why we can't use the placeholder. I want to show you the same form on uh, Safari. Uh, mobile, Safari, and iOS. Bear with me just a moment here. I'm going to turn on voiceover. Voiceover on Safari. Mobile, contact us. I'm going to uh, swipe into first name. First name star. Text field. Double tap to edit. And it does exactly the same thing. It says uh, first name star edit. And what it's doing is it's again, it's, it's reading the actual um, placeholder. So I'm just gonna mess around here a little bit. I, I didn't even try this uh, before. But I'm gonna go in here and I'm gonna go to that first name input. I'm gonna try to just see what happens if I remove this placeholder. So uh, on the fly, I removed the placeholder. So let me see if it took. I'm going to go to contact, contact us. And now I'm going to swipe to first name again. Text field. Double tap to edit. OK, I'm going to swipe back. Contact us. I'm going to swipe to uh, first name. Text field. Double tap to edit. OK, so all it said was text field, double tap to edit. The user of the screen reader, the voiceover user in this case, would have no idea what that form field was for. They have no idea. Uh, and again, this goes back to a critical, a critical issue.
if I added the label, so let me just go do that as well. Uh, and I'm gonna show you how that, when I said the four ID, I wanna show you what I meant by the four ID. I'm gonna go in here and I'm gonna add a label and I'm gonna call the label first name. I'm gonna close the label. And then this is where I use my four. So I'm gonna do four equals, and I'm just gonna do you, 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 four use will be fine. And what the four has to do is it has to match the ID of the input that it's associated with. So I'm gonna do ID equals, I'm gonna do you, 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 and then close that. So now, so now let's go listen to what that sounds like. I'm gonna, contact us. I went back to contact us. I'm gonna swipe and it's gonna, I wanna swipe actually twice because I wanna go into the form element. First name, Oops. last name star, first name, text field. See now, to edit. see now it says first name, text field double tap to edit. That's all the information that the screen reader, user need, the screen reader user needs to be able to understand what that form element is. All right. I'm gonna move, move it along here. So, so here's what I'm talking about uh, labels uh, versus placeholders. So let me explain what a placeholder text is. A placeholder text is typically inside of the input or it visually appears inside the input. It's an attribute for the input and a lot of people use it as a visual label. Well unfortunately that doesn't work very well and there's there's several reasons why. One of which is that the gray on, on the browser, the browser default for the color, the gray is, does not meet color contrast. So it fails co color contrast. Um, Plus, the placeholders disappear on focus after you start typing. So there's some cognitive issues there as well. So the um, what, what placeholders are, tip, are should be used for is to give you an example of what the input should be. Now, I have an, I have a, uh, an input that's visually on the screen at the moment, and the label is an email address. And then there's a uh, input. It's a text input that's directly to the right of it. And the placeholder is example at address.com. And what this, what this says to the user is it says, hey, this is where you put the email address in, and this is the format that you need to put it in. And that's really, really good information. Now, as far as mobile devices are concerned, it's a really, it's a really good idea to have the, uh, the visual label uh, directly above the input. Uh, it, it gives a nice visual look. Uh, and a lot of designers like that too. Now, there is a lot of designers that do not like a visual label to be you know, outside of the input. That's why they like using the placeholder so much. And this is that sneak peek I was gonna show, show you all about. This is what we term you know, as a floating label. And what happens here is when I tab into it, it, it looks on the screen, it looks like a placeholder. But when I tab into it, it shifts upward. And now it acts as a label. And now I'm going to tab again to the password. So the password shifts. So now I'm gonna tab back up to email or username and I'm just gonna type in, I typed in CB Averett and then that, that label that was acting as a placeholder actually becomes uh, a visual label that's above the input. It works really, really well. This particular example is, uh, is completely CSS, completely CSS. So uh, if, you turn, if you turn JavaScript off, uh, if you even turn, C if you bring your own CSS, it still, it still works, it still works very well. So let me show you this on a mobile device as well. Show bookmarks, button. Show bookmarks, mobile letter R, bookmarks, back button. CSS floating label, CSS, fo CSS floating labels, heading level one, main, okay. landmark. So I'm going to swipe to the input of email or username. Contact, up, please, elements, email or username, star, text field, required. It double tap me, to edit. It gave me all the information I needed. It's the name, role, and value, and I'm going to double tap it. Insertion point at end. 
And so now it, it draws the uh, placeholder and puts it into a label. This is a really, really good, effective way of keeping something still accessible and somewhat pleasing the designers as well. Uh, it's a very, very popular technique now. Uh, I'll be doing this, uh, a, a very detailed hour and a half seminar on this uh, tomorrow morning, as a matter of fact. So scrolling through this a little more. So let's talk about required fields on an input. Um, there's something called way aria. We normally call it aria, A-R-I-E. It's, it's a way to enhance a screen reader's uh, experience. We have to be really, really careful with that though because sometimes it could also mess up the experience if it's not used correctly. But in this case, I can use an attribute on the input called aria required equals true. If, the, if, if it asks that I put in an email address, but I forget to put in the at gmail.com and I just put in the format, but it's waiting for me to put in the at, I can do an aria invalid. So what that, what that says is, hey, you got an input here, but it's not the right input. Uh, also, if you use HTML5, which is all it is is just the required attribute, um, then that will also let the screen reader user know uh, that that field is required, or you can just put it in the label, and I recommend that one the most because it's that's good for all users. Just actually put it in parentheses in the label, uh, and then when they land on it, it would say like first name required. Uh, you can also use CSS to kind of visually present things, and and say so, say you have a uh, er some uh, an error, so you you fill in the information, or you don't fill in the information, but you hit submit. There's so many different methods to that. There's so many different ways of doing that. Uh, I'm just going to touch on a, a few right here. Uh, one of the ways that you can do it is say it's client side, it's client side error messaging. Uh, if you, if you um, sit like, like at the very top, like if there's several things that's messed up, there's, if there's several elements that's, that's uh, produced an error, you could put at the top something that says, Hey, you, you got some errors here. You got some problems on the page, and then just send focus to it. You can visually take it, and you can say, "I'm going to take that input," uh, and, and I also have to change the aria dynamically, change the aria. But I'm going to make the background pink. But the ones that are right, I'm going to make the val. title that typically works really really well uh, some more you know some more techniques um, I, I see a lot of people using HTML5 inputs uh, I want to talk to you those about those here in a moment in detail but I'm not sure that we're gonna have time but uh, they're not fully accessible we have to be very very careful uh, HTML5 input types and some of the HTML5 attributes uh, it, it, it brings it brings some validation and some error messaging out of the box from the browser, but unfortunately what it brings is not fully accessible. So we still have to add some scripting to what, we, what, we, what we've done. I wanna go into um, show you what a, uh, some correct coding looks like. Uh, so what I have open now is I have a contact us form. It looks very similar to the one I just showed you, but now behind the scenes, let's just go look at some of this code. So now behind the scenes, I've got a label and it's got the four and it's in the four points to the ID. It says ARIA required equals true. That's a great deal of information and just an, uh, a, uh, everything that a screen reader, re reader needs to know about, about using uh, that form element. When they land on it, it gives them all the information that they need. And I could go on and show you these. They're, they're really similar, like last name has the four that points to the ID of the uh, input element that aligns with it and so forth and so on. But this, this is a very well done form and it would work very well for screen reader users. And if you notice, it didn't even visually change too much on the screen. So this kind of, this kind of idea crosses over very easily 
to uh, to mobile users. Uh, Safari and iOS uh, Talkback uh, in Chrome on, on an Android device they handle these very well very well in other words they're very well supported. So uh, I'm going to move through a little bit quicker through some of these because I definitely want some questions and answers time. Um, we, we do have some uh, ARIA alerts uh, and again I'm going back to the way ARIA yeah, there's some things called live regions, and what a live region says is, hey, if you inject something into this element, if you inject some text, whatever it is, announce it to the screen reader at the same time, at the time that it was injected. This is very, very helpful for, for uh, error, error validation, because what you could do is say, for example, you uh, have have your have your uh, form element validation that when you when it uh, when you focus out of it when you like tab and you focus out of it then the error message appears and, and maybe it was your first name so maybe it says you tab out of your first name but you didn't write anything in there so you say so then on the screen possibly in red with some some uh, you know error images around it or something it says first names required at that point well as soon as that got injected if you code that correctly that information can be announced to the uh screen reader user it's, it's very very helpful um so what, one of the things i do want to point out is this is a, this is a, a you know very limited hour that we have here there's so many different things and so many different avenues and i want to encourage all of you to try to go out and do some research on all of this but I, I want you to know but by far i've just kind of I'm just kind of touching on a few things that I hope can kind of get you pointed in the right direction. Um, so I'm going to skip that. Uh, I do want to show you some of these input types. Now, these behave differently on browsers, but if we look at the different input types, so I'm gonna go down here to color. But first of all, let, let's, just, let's just see what happens here. Give me just a moment here. Okay, so I'm gonna go and I'm gonna start here with default and I wanna tab down here let's go to email yeah let's go look at the code i'm going to inspect element and this is the this is the uh code uh for element so i've done an implicit label instead of explicit that means the, the label opening or the inputs inside the opening and closing label that works that works uh, fine um and I've got input type of email. Now, what that means, it means something different to different browsers. Um, I want to go back to that date. If I click, excuse me, for that color. If I, if I do color here and I click on it, I have this color slider thing that pops up. The browser is actually doing this. But you can code it. All you have to do is code it, the type input. Let's take a peek at that for this color one. Type input type equals color so it's really really cool stuff that you can do with this however the problem with it is it's not fully accessible and i want to make sure everybody's aware of that but the things that are accessible they're really cool and really fun to use uh if i'm on a well here i'll show you let me show you i'm going to open up my um apple my ios device voice over off i just turned off voiceover and I want to go find, bear with me here. I don't think I saved it as a bookmark. Well, I didn't save it as a bookmark. Oh, well, uh, it does uh, totally different things on an iOS device. So let me explain that for a moment. If, if I use the email type, uh, type email, then when a user clicks in there, a keyboard comes up with the at symbol on it. If I use something that's only a date, like, like number, for example, if I use number, uh, see like right in, in a Firefox browser, what happens is I've got a, a place I could just uh, choose the arrows up or down to change the number, and that comes out of the box. That's kind of a free thing. Um, 
when I do that on an iOS device, the number pad, like you only use for like uh, making phone calls, that comes up. Because because really, why do you need uh, letters when you're only going to be entering numbers? And so there's really cool stuff like that that's happening. I encourage you to go look at these. Uh, they're really fun. However, just know you want to make sure that you do a full test of accessibility. If you do really, if you really would like to use them, then you probably want to uh, make sure you do some additional scripting to add some uh, some accessibility uh, functionality to that. I want to skip way down here and go to. Uh, uh, mobile screen readers. Okay, so this the, you've kind of heard a little bit about this already. Um, as far as voiceover is concerned, voiceover comes with the um, with a Safari, uh, mobile Safari. It also comes with a Mac, but there's all kinds of other uh, screen reader users, uh, or excuse me, screen reader uh, applications. Uh, another one is TalkBack for Android that works just as well. They they work very very similar. However, they are different, and they are they do. Um, they do behave differently sometimes. In other words, one thing might not support something as well as something else. But as far as the screen reader is concerned on an iOS device, I want to pull that up. And I'm just going to go to a site. Um, I'm going to go to, look at apple.com, why not? I'm just doing this on the fly at the moment. So I got apple.com. Uh, now I'm going to turn over, turn on voiceover. And the way I turn on voiceover is I've got a setting that I, I have set in my accessibility area of my settings where I can just triple tap my power button, or excuse me, my home button, triple tap my home button, and voiceover cuts on. So let me do that real quick. Voiceover on Safari. Open menu. Blank. Global navigation. Navigation. Landmark. Okay, so so it just it just turned on, and when I want to go from each element to each you know to each element that's visually here on the screen, I'm going to swipe to my right. So let me swipe. Apple. Blank. Shopping bag. Shows pop up. iPhone. Heading level one. Blank. Article. Landmark. This is seven. Heading level two. Blank. End article. If I want to go the other way, I just swipe right to left iPhone, heading level one, blank, shopping bag, shows hop up. Apple, blank, open menu, blank, global when, navigation, navigation, landmark. When I want to engage something, or in this case, like if you had a mouse, if I wanted to like uh, um, open this, what I have to do is double tap. So I'm going to double tap. I have no idea what's going to happen here, but I'm going to double tap. Close menu, blank, global navigation, navigation, landmark. Okay, it gave, you, it gave me some additional navigation. That's pretty good. Now I'm going to swipe through this. Apple, blank. Shopping bag, shows hop up, Mac, blink, iPad, blink, iPhone, blink, watch, blink. Okay, I want to go to the watch area, so I'm double tap again. Watch, blink. Open and, menu, blink, and, global navigation, navigation, landmark. And it opens up that link. Now, the other part of this is, is what's called the rotor. If I take both of my fingers, and there's a picture of that right here. If I take both of my fingers and put two and just kind of turn it, let me show you what that looks like. Containers, headings, like form controls, like headings, containers, speaking rate, lines, words, characters, edit, edit, vertical navigation, images, zero images, landmarks, images, landmarks. Six lab lists, the tables, zero tables, form controls, links. So I'm going through Three, all these different. Headings. I'm going through Twenty all these headings. different things that could be on the page. I landed at headings. Once I'm there, I don't have to navigate through every single element by swiping left or right. If I swipe top to bottom, whatever set in my rotor takes me to that. So now I'm going to swipe top to bottom, and hopefully it's going to take me to the next heading. So let's take a look at that. Apple Watch, heading level one, main landmark. Apple Watch Series 2, heading level two. Apple Watch Nike Plus Series 2, heading level two. Apple Watch MS Series 2, heading level two. Apple Watch Edition Series 2, heading level two. So it's taking me to each heading. And, and, and I would do that instead of trying to swipe to every single thing. It just gets me around a little bit faster. Voice over off. 
Uh, I want to go over to um, uh, mobile accessibility uh, accessibility testing tools. But before I do that, there's one thing that I, I really want to point out that's extremely, extremely important in accessibility and what we do with mobile devices. And again, this, this is crosses over to desktop as well. I think the most important rule is whenever you can use native HTML elements that are out of the box, use those before you do anything else. In other words, if you can design this great, custom, beautiful button that looks just totally amazing, well, if you do that and it's a custom button, you got to script it. What I mean by that is if you use just the button, the HTML button element, you get accessibility free out of the box. It comes with it. You don't have to script it. But if you want to make something look different uh, and you want to use a custom element, you got to take all that script, you got to take all the, the things that happen, the functionality of that button, and actually script it and make it happen. And that's much harder to do than just using the HTML button to begin with. Um, with that said, I want to show you guys a few, just a few tools that I do use. Again, a lot of this, a lot of this for mobile, like, uh, like for Firefox, I could have Firefox open here. And I am going to, I, I got this web developer toolbar. I'm going to uh, resize and I'm going to view responsive layouts. And this gives me the mobile version of what that looks like. It also gives me different um, resolutions. Like there's 480 by 320, there's 600 by 800. If you've got media queries that you use in your CSS, that's what will dictate how this is going to be visually presented. Uh, but but this is a tool. So there's some crossover between testing with desktop and testing with mobile. Again, the best thing you can do though is to open up a mobile device and actually do your testing on that. I want to show you the HTML code sniffer as well. I'm going to go ahead and do it right here on my on this Apple page. It's a bookmarklet and it works really really well. Um, is is the HTML code sniffer. So what it, what I just did is I just did it. It's an automated scan, and what the code sniffer found was 22 errors, 54 warnings. I'm going to just turn off the errors just because I, I mean, excuse me, the warnings because I want to look at some of the errors. So now I'm going to go into the 22 errors. I'm going to view report, and now it gives me a really nice kind of interface here of where the things are and what the problems are. And this is a really good tool. It's a really good tool. There's, there's some, a lot of false positives that we might have to weed through, but all in all, it's, it, it works really well. Uh, I use this for mobile quite a bit. Another thing too, is if you go and do some investigation of bookmarklets, uh, I can show you one that Paul Adam did. I'm sure a lot of you might know Paul Adam. He's a really, really good developer. Uh, he, he took uh, this, uh, this bookmarklet that he's got here, and he was able to create uh, these things like um, are, you know, tell you what's on the page. So if I go to images, it says, hey, there's no images on this page, but it's, it's a, a wealth of, of different items. Now, what's really cool about this is these, these things can also work with, in conjunction with a mobile device too. So you can do some of that automated testing uh, using these book markets. Uh, I tell you what, it's 152. I definitely want to allow some time for some great questions. So, uh, what do we what do we have? What kind of questions right. do we have? Um, so, the first question we have is from Ronald Bissessar. Uh, the question is, what would be the reason for turning off pinch to zoom? Oh, that's a great question, Ronald. Great question. The, the what I have found is, uh, and, and I, I'm I'm not I don't totally understand, but from my experiences, is just what a designer. A designer chose. A designer did not want it to get, uh, you know, pinch to zoom to work. They just didn't like that, that look and feel or something. That, and there might be other reasons. There very well could be other reasons, but that's the ones that I experienced the most. That's a great question. Okay. Um, the next is more a comment um, from Kurt. I'm not going to pronounce your last name right, but anyway, Kurt asks or Kurt mentions that uh, some people may not know that color contrast rules don't actually apply to logos, so that's something to keep in mind. There's a little bit of wiggle room. Oh yeah, Kurt. Yeah, great job, Kurt. Thank you. That's exactly right. I'm glad you mentioned that. The, uh, yeah, logos. Like if you have a logo that that you've got your own branding, you don't have to worry about color contrast on those. The, those are kind of allowed. Yeah, great, Kurt. Thank you. You're okay. exactly right. 
The next question is from Gurpreet Kaur, and uh, Gurpreet asks, how do you make floating labels accessible? Well, that is a really good question, and it might be a little too in-depth here, but let me give you kind of a, a brief overview. Um, there's, there's several ways to do it. Uh, again, it's the same thing. It's the, um, it's, it's the four ID method. Uh, we can go look at that. Let me, let me show you that. It's a good question here. Let's see here. Here's the floating label that I, I, I showed you earlier. And let me just go ahead and clear this name out. And so let's, let's go look at this. Uh, well, first of all, let me just turn off CSS. I'm going to disable CSS. If I disable CSS, this is nothing more than a form input with a label. That's all this is. And then I do, I do, I use the CSS to be able to, to uh, make the floating label, I guess, happen. But let's go look at this code. And this is the raw markup code, HTML. You'll see that there's an input. And the ID is username input. But if you go over here to this label, you're going to find that the four matches the ID of username input. So it's, it's actually exactly the same. A floating label is exactly the same as you would do a normal form. A regular form is not a floating label. But you just add the CSS to make all that stuff happen. Now, there's other ways to do it with JavaScript. I've done that as well. I've recently discovered this whole CSS thing. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty cool, but it's, it's exactly the same. It's exactly the same. Great question. Thank you. All right. Um, the next question is, will you share the URLs in your presentation with them? And I can send an email out with that if you um, give those to me afterwards, CB. Sure, I'd be happy to do that. Yeah, sure. I'd be happy to do that. Um, and just so everybody knows, we are recording the webinar and it will be available online um, hopefully in the next week or so. Um, it kind of depends on how the captioning um, works out when I transfer it to YouTube. Um, so keep an eye out for that and I'll include that information with the email that has CB's links. Uh, the next question for, is from Siri Balusani, and they ask, are there any tools to test native apps? Uh, I do think that, um, and this is a little bit beyond my expertise. Uh, so what, what, uh, what Siri is asking about is, you know, we, when we talk about mobile, there's web mobile and then there's native mobile. So native, native mobile is kind of a different beast, so to speak. It's a different type, it's a different developer, it's a different language. And I, unfortunately, I don't do that. I do know, I, I, I think I know that um, uh, DQ has some tools that are in the making for testing native. I don't think they're quite out yet, um, but I would just maybe kind of keep an eye on it. Uh, I think the release might be soon. I'm, I really don't know for sure, though. Unfortunately, I can't answer that one very well. Okay. Um, our next question is from, uh, I think, Mersim On, and I apologize to everyone if I mispronounce your names. I'll just get that out of the way right now. Um, and this is uh, sort of a comment. They say that CSS um, floating labels to keep it CSS only and accessible um, is by using colon valid in CSS to keep labels from moving back to input areas, even when there's content already after the focus is gone. But um, there's an issue using colon valid in CSS for that. So I'm not sure if you've got all that. Yeah, I think that's where you're going with that, Mercy. That, that's, a, that's a good point. Uh, the, 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 the problem with using valid is, is you have to use the valid. And this is what she's saying. You have to lose the valid to uh, to be able to do the CSS floating labels. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes you're using the valid in an improper way. So that's a really good point. That's a really good point. So you don't really want to decide if the, if the CSS version was for you. Uh, you might you might go more, if you decide that you did want to view floating labels, you might want to go towards more like a JavaScript scripting type floating labels. That's a really good point. Thank you. Yes. All right. Our next question is from Angela French. Uh, Angela asks, where does one get that last bookmark clip you described? Um, that is, uh, God, go search um, Paul, I think pauljadam.com website. I think that's where you can find that one. I tell you what, though, I'll see if I can include that in the, um, in maybe my list of links that, that I've kind of mentioned here. 
Yep, that would be great. Uh, the next question is from Fabiola Lopez. They ask, is there an accessible carousel for iOS and Android um, or a good example or good practices uh, for carousels? Um, yeah, there is, um, uh, there is, I might need to send this to you as well. I'm not No. CB, if you're talking, I think we've lost your audio a little bit, or maybe it's just me. Um, ah, there we go. Hey, CB, you, your audio went out for a little bit and just came back. Could you answer that question again? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I, I, what I'm saying is um, there might be something in this uh, way, ARIA authoring practices, maybe a slider, is that? I don't know. Um, unfortunately, I don't have a good mobile one. Uh, you know, I'll try to find one. I, I don't know. I just, I don't, I don't know. Um, yeah, that's my final answer. I'm, I'm <laughs> okay. I don't have a good answer for that one. Uh, I know there's some out there. I think I've seen some. It's really kind of hard to do, though. Yeah, hard is kind of subjective. But yeah, I, I'm sorry, man. I just don't, I don't know of one right off the top of my head, unfortunately. Okay. They're challenging. They're challenging, yeah. no doubt. The next question uh, is, is there a mobile simulator to test apps in Android using TalkBack? That's the one more time, I'm sorry? Um, is there a mobile simulator to test apps in Android with TalkBack, the, the Android screen reader? The TalkBack, I, I am not, I'm not sure. I'm not sure about that one. I, I'll find the answer out for that one. Uh, who, who asked that one? Um, that was uh, Matthias uh, Torsivia. Matthias, let me do this because that's a really good question. Uh, I'm more of a more of an iOS developer, but I I know there is one. I just can't come up with the name of it at the moment. Okay. So let me let me get you to do this if I, if I may. Um, let me. Do this. If I get that person to email me or, or any of these questions, if you want to email me, uh, is cb.avery at dq.com. I'd be, I'd be happy to spend a little bit of time to try to find out the answer to those questions. So uh, I just uh, posted it on the, on the, uh, in the um, screen share, but it's CB, like Charlie Brown, and it's dot Averitt, and that's A-V as in Victor, E-R-I-T-T. -T at dq.com, d-e-q-u-e.com. Give, give me an email and I'll see what I can make happen for you. Good question, thank you. All right. Um, so follow up from the earlier CSS comment. Uh, Mersim just saw the view source of your CSS only floating label, but why have the text input before the label? Uh, you know, I could, I could probably have it anywhere. Um, yeah, I could have it there. It'd probably even be better there. That's a great idea. Okay. Yeah, it's just the way I did it. I did it kind of fast. I did it. Uh, I, I did it really, really quick to demonstrate something. So yeah, I think uh, I don't remember if there was exact reason, but I, I can totally see that it would be beforehand, and it would probably be better to have it beforehand. Okay. Um, okay. So the next question from Joseph Schunk. Um, there was like a minute uh, during the presentation where you. Uh, where we sort of lost our connection with UCB, um, and he wonders if we're going to get a copy of the slides since it went out for a bit. Um, I think we can work something out there, and I'll let you know that'll be included in the email if um, if we are able to do that. Um, yeah, I apologize. I didn't know it went out. I didn't, yeah. I, I didn't know it went out. I hope it didn't go out too long. I'm sorry. <laughs> Not too long. Um, so the next question is from Abraham Campos. It is, is there any accessibility technique that applies for desktop but won't work for mobile? Yes. 
Yes, absolutely. A good rule of thumb is don't rely completely on desktop techniques. Um, oh, wait, let me see. I'm, I'm thinking testing here. Is there any accessibility technique that applied for desktop won't work for mobile? Yes. Yeah, so, so what we have to be really, really careful with is when we do scripting and we do what's called a VIT handlers, you know, we could do things like, uh, you know, for a mouse, like mouse in, mouse out. Uh, and we can do things like that, but sometimes those kind of scripting does not always uh, align over to mobile when we're tapping, when we're swiping and tapping and doing things like that. So we got to be really, really careful with with event handlers in, in JavaScript. Uh, you know, also there, we we got to make sure that we understand too that when, when we're going from desktop to mobile or even Internet Explorer to Firefox or or Edge to to Chrome. Those are all different companies, and they all uh, display things in a different way. Yes, they have this this uh, uh, these standards that they're so supposed to follow, but just some things are are not supported as well as other things in other areas. So the best thing to do is to test it. So if there's something that works great on a on a desktop. You definitely want to take that same thing, get out, a, you know, an Android device or get out your iOS device and test that exact same thing to make sure that what you think is happening is happening. But there's absolutely there's techniques that that just they don't they don't align correctly. They don't they don't work. Correctly. You know, a really good example of that uh, and this. You'll probably find this to be really crazy is until recently field set and legend, which has been an HTML tags for forever i mean for the longest time well ios safari just started picking that up field set and legend and that that just that kind of floors me it's fixed now but up to like maybe even like a year ago it wasn't supported at all great uh, go with one more question Caitlin? yeah I, we've Before got like a you know another question and another comment and then i think we'll wrap it up um so the next question okay is um, is there going to be a webinar for native mobile? And I can answer that one. Um, hopefully later in the summer, like, you know, maybe late July, August, uh, we will have a mobile webinar um, that, you know, one of our experts in native mobile will, uh, will cover. So yes, that is in the works. We're actually, um, in the midst of developing the iOS version of our mobile testing tool. So their time is kind of taken up there right now. But yeah, do keep an eye out. Hopefully in a few months, we'll have that ready. Um, and then the last comment from Joseph Sherman um, is that Google does have a basic accessibility checker for Android apps in the App Store. Um, and I believe that is called just accessibility checker. And it's um, it's really good for testing talkback accessibility specifically. So I think that's it. Very good. Thanks, everyone, for joining us today. I appreciate it very much. And thank you, CB, for presenting. Uh, thanks, everybody. And we'll see you around. Thank you.